So just real quickly in the little bit of time we have left, you kind of skipped over the part of the grail stone mm -hmm. narrative and how you get that into your thesis. You want to just elaborate a, a little bit on that yeah. relation? How does the grail and the stone get pushed to, get into the argument? Absolutely. Um, so uh, the grail, and the, first I'm looking at the holy grail. I, I, when I was in the uh, alchemy and I think the holy grail class or the Arthurian class at the same time, I was thinking about how there was this <clears throat> super emphasis on the philosopher's stone as like a word for the ultimate achievement. And then it's and then like now there's like this switch towards the Holy Grail is this ultimate achievement. And then there I saw the meta narrative even there, right? Culturally in this emphasis on the stone to the emphasis on the Grail. Uh, and I just started seeing in the Arthurian class like I've never seen the Holy Grail is the Holy Grail of Holy Grails. It's the ultimate object to be attained. Is the ultimate is symbol of the ultimate pursuit. Um, and so it became a symbol of enlightenment for me. And so I could do some nice work to connect how important it is to the Abrahamic tradition. But to be honest, I think that would be a little bit of a disservice to how big I think the Grail myths really are. I mean, the Arthurian, I mean, the classical, oh, sorry, the Christian stuff's there, the classical stuff's there, uh, tons of stuff's there. And so I, I, there are some connections to the Christian myth, but it's, I think, far beyond that. So to me, I think... Uh, Wolfram's grail stone is really nice because there you have an actual image of a stone that has this deep relationship with fluids, with water. You know, he has the stone, and, and there's a scene where the stone is there, and then uh, it's a water starts filling the basin and, and rivers or something like that. Um, yeah, it's for the baptism of the fear baptism fits. of fear fits, yeah, right? Holds the cup towards the stone, and the water flows from it. And so that uh, that to me, yeah, that to. It's almost even hard to say more because it's all just right there. <laughs> you know, there is the grail stone, you know. I like, I like the image. Uh, there's some other nice synthesis. You, you, Moses, of course, taps on the stone three times and, and then water comes out. And mm -hmm. I like, uh, for this one's for Maria, that story. I think it's Tom Thumb. I don't remember what story it is, but there's this giant that a guy's got a trick. And he tricks the giant into thinking he can squeeze fluid from a stone. And really, it's just cheese that he's squeezing. You know, there's even a Mickey Mouse version of this. Uh, but but to me, uh, that's a nice little. There are lots of these nice little catch, catches of the Grail and the Stone, or, or the fluid. And, and let me just end with this one. Here is uh, this candle I lit in the beginning, right? And so one nice little twist is that. Um, Fruits appear solid from the outside. The apple is this very hard fruit. But apple juice is the most popular fruit juice in the world. And so it's tricky because on the surface, just like atoms, we think of them as solid. But when we get deep into them, we realize that they're filled with juice. Just like humans, you know, we, we project solid at ourselves, but we're like 99% of our molecules are water. Uh, 70, you know, around 70% of our mass is water. And so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of examples where the surface suggests material and, and particulation, but deeper shows the fluids and the, and the waves. Great. Thanks, Will. Thanks. Naturally, I'd like the, <laughs> that scene in Fulfram to be brought forward a little bit yeah, more that's... <laughs> because it so dramatically illustrates your thesis. One more I, I just want to mention, too, because uh, to me it's a big one, is, uh, and it's similar to that one, is when Jason and the Argonauts, they finally get to the uh, the place where the golden apples are. And by the way, Prometheus sends Heracles to get the golden apples. And when he's there, he's thirsty as can be. And he knocks on this rock and water starts coming from the rock, just like the story of Moses. And uh, so the Argonauts show up coming from a desert carrying their boat. It's that much of a dry situation. Uh, this is the ultimate wasteland for me. And then when they get there... Uh, they're shown the, the water that Hercules found and, and the whole place, the tree dies and then is revived. And so there you have another water and rock uh, symbol. Right. And a wasteland redemption. Because to me, mm -hmm. the wasteland is the reductive. That's too simple, sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm reducing. Uh, but to me, a big part of the wasteland is, is uh, that cosmology of reductive atomistic materialism, um, whether it's articulated philosophically or simply uh, demonstrated symbolically as a wasteland. Well, thank you, Will. And in the interest of time, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, Maria, I'm going to uh, hang up on that phone and call you back briefly on my cell phone, and uh, we'll chat for a second with Kieran as well. Yeah. Okay, great. And during that time, I'm gonna, you're invited yeah, to respond to questions from 
Okay. From Give the him audience. A lot of time. Oh, well. <laughs> I, got, I got a question. He's going to be. I got them written out here. Uh, I'm ready. Call back. Briefly. Oh. So yeah, can, you want me to hang up now, right? Yes. Thanks, yes. Maria. Okay. I'll send you an email later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Now the real grilling starts, huh? <laughs> do you have one? Do you I mean, I do this all the time. I know, you do it all the time. But so I really want that. you to ask one. So, uh, which, I don't care. Um, okay, so I'm, I haven't read your whole dissertation, mm -hmm. as you know. But, um, slacker. So I know, like such pages. a slacker. I, 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 I don't have anything of my own to read right now. So, But in, in this, you write in the last paragraph, fluids and waves are capable of union and harmony. And then further down... The initial commitment to a materially grounded cosmology that is later enhanced, if not healed, by theoretical waves and symbolic elixirs. So what I'm wondering is, so as we move, you, you showed that, that image on the screen of, you know, the microwaves and the, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and moving x-rays and, and iPhones, mm -hmm. more and more and more of our existence is being connected through waves. Mm -hmm. So are we to then interpret from what you've studied and, and explored that we're moving into a more spiritually and connected existence? I, I think actually that egoism, the, the idea of isolating the ego, is actually dependent on a set of metaphors that are reinforced by this old materialistic cosmology. And that as we lose the materialistic cosmology of atomism that reinforces the vision of the ego as isolated, mm -hmm. then the whole egoistic philosophy finds far less foundation. And as the ego finds less foundation, uh, it's harder for it to sustain itself as the front and center of so many things. And so I think... Uh, you were asking about leading into a spiritual situation, and I first want to comment on how I think that we are leading away from the ultimate despiritualizer, which is self-obsession, <laughs> you know, self selfishness and, and uh, self-aggrandizement and stuff like that. So, so I do think, and I also believe that, uh, I think, so that makes people more primed for a more spiritual way of being, one. The other thing is, I think, as we start to see more union and we can understand that we are unified and not just like in this, oh, we're one with the universe kind of thing, but actually conceptualize how we, in fact, you know, mathematically, scientifically are not distinctly and infinitely isolated. I think that's another thing that makes the ground richer for a more spiritual relationship with reality. And so I think that these ground. two... Yeah. Uh, so these, these two foundations, these two shifts and foundations, I think, I think are... Are making are priming us for a much more uh, spiritually and altruistically driven reality. Uh, now we could talk about the other trends that are pushing the other direction. That but right. those are from other things, and and you have the big fight back for the ego with the iPhone and the MySpace and all that shit. But. Well, the the follow up question to that is just about if if um, wave theory is about the ability to unify yeah. and, and merge mm -hmm. particles. Mm -hmm. I think about that and yet how much our movement toward using more and more wave technology mm -hmm. creates a lot less community in certain ways mm -hmm. and connection. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering, okay, so how do you put those nice. together? Like exactly. how do you relate to what's happening to the dinner table? So I, uh, that's a great question. And I think, uh, I think Devin might ask something similar. So I mean, that's no, no, I, I want to hear. It. No, <laughs> but I, want, I want you to. I want you to ask. No, yeah, I think I think that I don't. know, It's hard for me to get on board with a romantic notion of those technologies mm -hmm. being liberating and enlightening, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I might focus. I don't know. I think they are, and they and they aren't. And mm -hmm. maybe it's just another chapter of of something that is perpetual and isn't really necessarily evolution to enlightenment. Right. I don't know. So, yeah, I, I, I would say that that's, that's a rough ground of, yeah. of the subject, I think, is, is um, what, yeah, what is, what is union with mm -hmm. those technologies and what is not. I mean, they seem to be responsible for a lot of illness. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, right. And things that... I don't know. I, I think I think those are 
they they get to be trickier and trickier words mm -hmm. when you really think about what they mean and what's really going on. Uh, so what uh, Devin was asking and and Britta too is basically like. You know, I'm talking about how waves enable metaphysical union, but like in a way, the, as much as these phones connect us more, they also make us, in a sense, more isolated. Right? I had that from my question. Uh, right. yeah, uh, and, and, and so did Maria too. <laughs> Maria, <laughs> Maria, <laughs> Maria also, uh, and and that is uh, that is absolutely true, and that's where I think um, scientifically, philosophically, there's this shift. There, this shift can happen, but but definitely socially, experientially, there's like. It's just con compensatory circumambulation of, of collective psyche in a sense, right? It's like where we become increasingly connected in this way. Lo and behold, the whack-a-mole pops up over here where we, we become less connected in this other way. And, and um, so I, I definitely think it's not like we've reached this big breakthrough and now everything is going to be good. You know, it's like definitely new, uh, new sides. And, and so I wanted to bounce into, too, just who Frankenstein is, right? The Frankenstein, subtitled The Modern Day Prometheus, is the original ultimate uh, demonstration of technology gone bad, gone too far, you know? And um, that, I think, certainly is a big, big threat. And I like this one story. And this is a story I wish I could, I literally wish I could tell this to every scientist in, in the world, um, especially the researchers. And that is that when Prometheus was finally freed, Zeus asked him to wear a ring. The chink of his chain is a ring. And this ring that all of the initiates into the Promethean mysteries of the Kabiroi, they all wore this ring. And the ring was a symbol of their restraint as scientists and inventors. To recognize, because it's to remember, just like Prometheus was restrained, okay, Mr. Technology, I'm going to let you free, but you better remember restraint or you're going to bring down the world again like you did last time because he is the ultimate revolutionizer. So, so the point is that uh, I believe in unchaining Prometheus, but just like the, the Zen idea of unleashing a tamed mind, I do think we got to remember restraint. We got to remember the, the risks of, of Frankenstein's. And, and as much as we might you know, like to be all happy about all these union and, and the social revolutions with Facebook and all that stuff, there's definitely, uh, definitely some threats on the other side where it's further isolating. You know, I do all my connection with people from inside my room by myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Waves. Uh, waves and material. When I was outside with lamps, I felt a couple of drops of rain, which could be very oh, appropriate. Wow. And I said, if it fell into hail, hailstone, right? That's <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> feels like it. Well, congratulations, mm -hmm. Dr. Lynn. Mm -hmm. It's been a real pleasure, and we'll look forward to continued conversations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow. And this is for you, and they, I, you need to unwrap that so I can sign it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we neglected to do that. Very well Thank done. Thank you, Karen. Excellent piece of work. Oh, man. That was a great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about the questions. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Get to see you on the camera. Can I add more? Yes. For God's sake, yes. <laughs> we need a hologram of Maria. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, Karen. Where's her wave particles? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool.